In this segment, we're going to cover some of the advanced configuration options that you need to go through when setting up a Aperture environment. First thing we're going to do is we're going to install something called the Local Mount Utility. The Local Mount Utility can be installed on any system that you want to be able to access the recovery points from. And we're going to use that later on in one of the other videos uh, to work with the SQL Server and recovering SQL data. We're going to leverage it to do mailbox level restores. We're going to leverage it to do file level restores, a bunch of different things. So the first things first, we've got to get it installed and get it set up. We're just going to go through the typical next, next, next type of wizard. Let it do the installation. It's very quick. Once this completes, we're going to fire it up, and that will give us, uh, like I said, access to the core server's recovery points, but from a thicker client versus a web client. One example where this is useful is, let's say, uh, when you mount a volume on a core using the web UI, you're mounting them, no matter where you're dialed into that core from, you're mounting that volume on the core. Whereas it may be more desirable to mount it locally. All right, so, you know, when I mount, I would go into a specific machine and I would go to the recovery points. I can expand and I can use the mount command here to go ahead and mount this volume. But again, it only mounts it to the core. Instead, we'll use the local mount utility and this is going to give us the ability to run this like I said from anywhere I could do this on the core it will then mount it on the core if I did it on my laptop it'll mount the volume remotely from the core to the laptop And the nice thing about this is uh, especially when we get into the SQL side of things when you need to actually recover a database or components of the database, you need to actually attach the database. SQL has a couple of requirements, one of which is the ability to appear as a local volume, the other is to make sure it's writable. And I can do that with the local mount utility from any machine. Now I can simply expand and I'll, I'll show you the, uh, the quick options that we want to set. The default mount point directory here Right, we'd like to change that to something a little more easier to find. Right, I usually, you know, for for demonstration purposes, I just go with c colon backslash mounts. I'll leave the credentials because I'm using my default account because I'm still on the core. If I'm running this from my laptop and I'm not a part of the backup server's domain, I can use different credentials. I'll say OK there. The next thing I want to do is I want to set up. This is a one-time only type of thing. For, for Mailbox Restore, what I have to do is I have to go into any recovery point and initiate the process of opening the database. Once I do this one time, it'll mount the volumes in the background, and we'll cover this more when we get to the video about Exchange, um, but we're just doing a first time setup here. It wants the location of the DSM underscore UI executable. We're just going to simply give it that. It'll now store it permanently in the registry so that every subsequent time we go in, it will always automatically be there. All right. Now it's going to go ahead and open that database in the mailbox restore UI. Uh, we're not going to do anything with it here. We're going to cover that in, in another video. So we're just waiting for that to open so that we can shut it down. Anytime you're done using the uh, local mount utility, just click on active mounts and dismount all. That way you're not taking up additional system resources with mounts that are uh, outstanding. And that's it for now for the local mount utility. Back on the main UI, the other things we want to do as part of our advanced configuration is on the core side, we have some things we have to think about, right? So number one is your default retention settings, your events settings, notifications, things like that. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go to Tools. And as I mentioned before, you have a Downloads tab. Downloads will get you the local mount utility or the agent if you want to deploy it manually. Under Configuration, repositories, I can go in and manage my repositories. Again, I can have up to 
255 repositories on a single core. Each repository can be made up of up to uh, 4096 segments. A segment is a, a piece of disk that you allocate to this repository. Adding a storage location is as simple as clicking on add storage location, give it a path. So what I will do real quick is jump out to my repository volume. I have a little bit more room on this so what I'm going to do is create a new folder. We'll call this repository as well, but we'll call it repository 2. And we'll just copy that path back over here. We'll go ahead and put the path in. We'll make it 50 gigs and we'll hit save. Once this completes I will now have two segments. They'll both be on the same disk and now my repository total is 250 gigs and I dedupe across that entire two separate segments. If I looked at this from this perspective right I get um, my repository which is going to be pre-allocated on the first write right, so all of the 50 gigs will be consumed immediately even though there's no data in it and then the rest of the files here are basically metadata that helps Apisure find what it's looking for I already have one of these out here uh, for the first segment of the repository right, this is going to add up to about 200 gigs so now I have both of my repository segments and again these can be on the same disk they could be on different disks different subsystems could be internal could be iSCSI SAN could even be a NAS device although it is recommended the NAS be you know performant under configuration there's also encryption keys right we set this one up when we uh, ran through the initial installation. We can have multiple encryption keys should we choose. We can also export them and then bring them over to another system if necessary. Under events, the default configuration allows for event notification provided we set up the SMTP settings. All right, so SMTP settings, very simple. Right, we're going to enable email notification. You put in all the relevant information. You can craft what the email looks like and then send a test mail to confirm that it works. Repetition reduction. This is something new in Apisure 5. What we're doing with this is instead of sending the same email about a problem every time it occurs, we're not going to repeat it for whatever value you set here. The default is every five minutes. So if I want to avoid getting an inbox flooded with you know tons of mail about the same problem I can I can throttle this back set it for every 30 minutes set it for every hour however often I want to be uh, notified for the notification group itself the default group gives you your standard events okay what you can do is customize this on a group by group basis this allows you to create multiple groups have for instance you know information about backups whether they succeed or fail in one group to your network operators you can also set up another group maybe for the executives that give the overall big picture telling you that everything is healthy All right you might have an advanced group that you know for the one who architects the backups to know that every last detail is perfect All right so you can define those these are global settings. We do also have the ability to override these settings when it comes to the individual servers that we're protecting. The next thing is the retention policy. The default is approximately three months. The retention policy allows us to go and say how long do I keep my snapshots before I roll them into a larger container so my individual snaps let's say I'm doing them every 15 minutes I decide I want to keep them for X number of days after X number of days I'm going to roll those into hourlies and then after X number of days I'm going to roll my hourlies into dailies, dailies to weeklies, weeklies to monthlies, monthlies to yearly 
Right? Using this methodology, I can reduce the footprint of the storage dramatically and keep much longer term data in this archived format just by setting my retention. Attachability. This is going to get covered under SQL. This is where we basically tell the SQL server that we would like to leverage to use for attachability testing. Settings gives us a little bit of a deeper dive on you know, setting up specifics about the way the core behaves, right? From, you know, the cache locations to the number of concurrent transfers. You can see the defaults here are three concurrent transfers. If you have a very robust core, you can throttle this up to a higher number and allow you to do multiple simultaneous. You're doing, you know, a, a large, for instance, VMware environment this could be you know set to five or ten and you could be backing up five or ten of these at one time and if you have more than twenty or so machines on a box you know being able to do five or ten at a time is is kinda key but you also want to make sure you're not hammering that host you want to be able to throttle it based on the resources not only just here on the core but on the systems you're backing up the engine configuration is mostly about timeouts and ports. Um, all of this information was in, in the previous versions of AppAssure buried in the registry. Here you can see it's exposed. One last thing is on the deploy settings. In the previous video under installation, you saw that we went in and we used the bulk deploy method to push the agent out. One of the things that we can do here is, by default, it uses what's called a web installer. This won't work for you if you're in an isolated environment where you have no network or internet access from the agent computer. So what you can do is you can download the full agent and you can put that inside the installer directory and then you can come to the deploy settings and change the actual installer from the web installer to the full installer. That way it'll use it by default and it'll push it out without having to actually connect to the internet.